Something seems to be wrong with academic science. There's the ongoing replication crisis. Uh, there's also the overproduction of PhDs, which leads to widespread dissatisfaction and poor job prospects. And there's also the uh, stagnation in fields that were once, once very dynamic, like theoretical physics. When you compare this to the glory days of academic science back in the early 20th century, when there were constantly uh, massive breakthroughs being produced, of course, uh, in physics, uh, but also in fields like medicine, where there was the discovery of penicillin and the uh, development of the polio vaccine. And then also uh, Alan Turing and others uh, groundbreaking work in computing and cryptography. When you look at academic science today, there just aren't breakthroughs being produced at the same rate. And so the question is, what happened? Part of the explanation is that academic science was crippled by its own success. After World War II, um, in large part because uh, of this tremendous productivity, there was a huge influx of money and of talent into science. And you'd think this was a good thing, but it actually uh, strained a lot of the structures that had undergirded uh, science's previous functionality, which weren't able to scale um, and retain their functionality. To illustrate this, I'll talk about uh, the physics community in the early 20th century when it was uh, you know, the center of these, these incredible breakthroughs. And arguably, this period is really the crown jewel of academic science. When you look um, at how physics worked at this time, when you had these legendary figures like Oppenheimer, Niels Bohr, Einstein, Enrico Fermi, you see that it was an international community, but it was also a small one and a relatively informal and tightly knit one, bonded together by personal relationships. And so you had these close uh, personal collaborations and also uh, master-apprentice relationships. And you also had reputation in the field uh, managed in this relatively informal and unbureaucratic way where uh, the different physicists could directly look at the work of, of another and evaluate it well. And they would also be trusted in their evaluation by uh, the other scientists in the field. If you look at the life of a uh, physicist like Leo Szilard, uh, all of these things are illustrated very well. Uh, Szilard first, as far as we know, conceived of the nuclear chain reaction, and he uh, went on to play a very critical role in the Manhattan Project. He was initially trained uh, in Germany. He studied under Einstein and Max Planck. And after the Nazis came to, came to power, he fled to the United States and continued to conduct uh, a lot of fundamental uh, research in physics that would you know, eventually be, be crucial in the Manhattan Project. But he did all of this uh, without an official university appointment. He went around uh, to his different friend, to his friends at different universities in the United States, uh, funded his project through his wealthier friends, and also got laboratory space and research materials through his university friends, and uh, was able to do all of this research independently. It's hard to imagine a figure like Szilard existing today. Instead, uh, academic science, because it's so much larger, uh, has to rely on a much more bureaucratized model. Relati uh, reputation can no longer be managed in as direct and informal a way, but instead has to rely on credentials and other signals that are more like proxies of talent uh, instead of a more direct uh, reflection of it. Also, because of the huge influx of students, uh, it's not possible for the leading experts in the field uh, to give the time and attention that is necessary uh, to really properly mentor them and pass on their skills. And so there's a degradation in the traditions of knowledge as a result. And also because of the uh, larger focus on research, a lot of the attention of these uh, leading scientists is turned away from teaching and from mentoring the next generation. These problems 
aren't just aren't unique to research organizations. Uh, they also afflict uh, startups when they scale, uh, cultural movements when they scale, and so on. And so in many cases, the success of an organization can often lead to its decline and downfall rather directly. Uh, in order to avoid this, it's necessary to understand the particular structures uh, that are undergirding the functionality of the institution and to scale it in a way that preserves this functionality. I'm Zach Larangis. I work at Bismarck Analysis. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.